Hello and welcome to another one of our videos and this time I'm discussing a uh, uh, quite an interesting book um, from Esther Gokhale called, uh, which is called Eight Lessons to Back Pain. So let's get into it. So one of the things that I've uh, always never stopped doing over the last 18 years is trying to continually learn, find better ways to become fit and healthy myself but also be able to teach it to other people. So. Um, most of the best stuff I've learned are from making many mistakes and, and that ended up leading me to something that I didn't know and better ways of doing things so what I, maybe something I thought was good but then coming across something better and one of those times was several years ago when I was working with a lot of people with back pain and the stuff I knew wasn't really helping them and um, getting them out of things so I had to find something else to help them um, and this is usually where I would be looking for information with exercise interventions and stuff like that and, and this is where you know, a lot of the McGill stuff that I refer to quite a lot um, it really helped me quite a lot and you know, gave me a lot of different ways of, of, of doing things and, uh, you know, and, and that leads to other stuff and so on and so on. Um, so a, a lot of the time I've got to remind myself I've got to keep things simple because um, you can overcomplicate things and really look into things too far and you overlook the, the simplest, of, the easiest of things to begin with. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that, are, that comes up a lot is just everyday movement. So when you talk to people who have back pain, you ask them what makes your back hurt, the, you know, the answer is usually, okay, something simple like it's sitting or it's lying down or it's walking or it's... Not, 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 a, not a gym exercise or something strenuous, it's just something really insignificant that they can't seem to find any relief with. So obviously exercise intervention is a big part of getting on top of that, but what do you do in the meantime? What, just tell them to put up with it? So, um, you know, this is where you, I was looking for things to how, how do I sort of find better positions for them to accommodate the problems they're in, and that's when... Um, you know, I, I sort of come across some of these different methods. So, you know, obviously I'd be trying to use exercise to help them to sit, stand and walk and that, but um, I, I knew the problem was the way that they sat or the way that they stood, the way that they walked. Or the bending one's easier because it's very much relates to exercise and that, but the other one's not so much because you're not even moving sometimes. So, um, so the the big question is what, what's the best way to do these activities um, and, and as you'd expect it's not an easy answer to that so you had to sort of be creative and obviously that's where I come I, when I'm looking around and I'm you know come across things you find out someone's already done a lot of this stuff so you can go and uh, look into their research and their resources and learn from them uh, to see what you can learn so this video is pretty much explaining what I found was valuable to me. There might be other things that might be relevant to you, but this is what I found useful for what I what I discovered. So um, anyway, so that, that's the book that I'm referring to. Uh, and she's got like a whole um, institute sort of learning process, courses, all sorts of stuff. You don't have to be a trainer to do it either. So, um, so I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, anyway, so... One of the interesting things from her book is um, if you really look at the reason why she did the book is that she had real severe back pain herself and, and in her quest to try and find answers because her mainstream method, and she's a therapist herself, a physical therapist, so she already knew a lot about anatomy, a bit like me, anatomy and exercises and this and that, but it wasn't really helping her to the degree that she was she was looking for. So. She, the big thing that always come put up in her mind is how do people in third world countries who don't have access to trainers and therapists and chiropractors and all this sort of stuff, how do they manage their pain um, and and do they have pain to the same degree that we do in the western world so um, you know so she wanted she, she spent like a, a, a ton of time investigating and visiting these people uh, to see if there was something that she could learn from them, and sure enough, she did. So, um, and she learned from an institute in France that the industrialised countries do not use the body very well, and, and and a lot of damage is caused from the way that we sit, stand, and walk and stuff. Where the people who lived in the traditional cultures 
are able to work like extremely rigorous jobs for hours and hours at a time but never have any back pain. I'm sure there were some that did but not to the same degree that the people in the in the modern and more industrialised world who had access to much easier things, they seem to suffer more. So what is it that they were doing that, that we were not? So um, so in, in the picture here, like imagine working in a job doing this for 10 hours straight, like a lot of people, would, they, get, they get sought back from sitting in a chair. So how would they go doing that? They'd have no chance. Um, so anyway, she went to visit all these countries and, and that's how she ended up writing her book and coming up with her eight sort of lessons and methods of how to overcome things. And it's just observing how people were able to do things that look you know, incredibly difficult for anyone else. Um, you know, even with gym programs, would really struggle to do this every day, and yet they have no problem with it. So, um, so when she was coming up with it, uh, so she started to come up with um, looking at people like like this guy who's doing weaving all day, because a lot of people would say, okay, sit, sitting is a is the cause of my back pain, and maybe it's exacerbating. But if it was if it was sitting, then everyone who sits would have back pain, and that's where she found that the people like in these countries they they didn't have that problem, um, you know. And she noticed in the book that people who sat for long hours, uh, you know, could could easily overcome the problems from the way that they sat, not not the sitting itself. Um, the other thing that used to come up is it's old age. It's what causes our back pain. But again, she found people in these countries, like right up into the late 60s, you know, digging clay, mixing it to make bricks, uh, ma really intense manual labour without machinery, and they didn't have back pain. You know, so where people in the industrialised countries were significantly greater. So you can see their rates of back pain in a, were a 50 to 75% less than what's um, been documented in industrialised countries. So this is another example of like it's there's something that they're doing really well with the way that they're moving. It's not it's not sitting or it's not the occupation itself. It's it's the way that they're doing it. Because because if it was sitting here in the in the Western world, like a lot of the manual labourers still have quite a high rate of back pain. So if sitting causes your back pain and manual labour causes, what are you going to do? You got you. you it's not really either of them, it's the way that it's being done. Obviously there's other things to consider, such as stress and poor nutrition and you know um, the influences of what we're doing, but and then they're all definitely factors, so they're things you can't ignore. But if we were to just you know, to really look at it in a simplistic way of they're moving better and we're not, um, what can we learn from them and maybe address some of these things as well and then you can get on top of your your problem, but I won't go into all these other factors. But they're definitely things to consider. Um, all right. So, what are the eight lessons, and what did I learn from them? So, um, so the eight lessons pretty simple. In the book, she gives you heaps of illustrations and step-by-step -step instructions. I'm not going to go into how to do the lessons. I'm just going to discuss what they meant to me. But if you really want to learn them, uh, which I encourage you to, go get, get a copy of the book or check out her website and it will give you tons of information and stuff that you can do to actually learn these um, specific lessons. Um, so the first lesson is quite a simple one. Um, um, it's quite surprising how helpful it was when you're in pain. It's really just sitting down, um, which she calls stretch lying. All right, So something I never th uh, thought was going to really do a lot, but it, because at first, and even at first glance, it looks like it's not like a terribly great posture, um, and it's not sort of meant to be. It's meant to be a way to relieve the strain and the and the compression into the disc from the sitting position. So, the way that she teaches it, using little cushions and the specific angles, um, uh, helps you to sort of get like a gentle traction of the spine, which can be very therapeutic if you're in a lot of pain or your muscles are stuck in a spasm, which I'm sure people who have back pain uh, would know how useful that could be. Um, so it's different to try and stretch the muscles of the lower back, which is what many people try to do, which only serves to irritate them more. So, so doing these stretch positions, that's actually a very good way to just get a disc bulge. So it's the last thing you want to do. This is, as you can see here, she's not actually trying to stretch, she's just trying to decompress it. Alright, so um, 
is quite a, a, a clever way to use different cushions and positions to just try and relieve uh, the, the tension in that part of the spine. One interesting part of this which comes up a lot in, in all of the exercises is the foot position. You think what the hell's that got to do with anything if I'm sitting down? And that was probably my first thing but um, it, she encourages it to be done even in these sitting things because it le helps you when you do get to the standing and the and the walking and the hip hinging and things like that because you're, you're encouraging it from every position so it, it, it makes it easier to get better pelvic and spinal positions uh, as you get into the more difficult tasks. Um, neck position was another one that comes up nearly all the time. Again it has a real high emphasis on posture so this poor head and neck position and you'll see in a second can be influenced by the pelvis but um, can be influenced by other things as well but it really throws everything out. So. Um, and, and this again comes back to her observing people who are carrying things on their shoulders or on their heads and they didn't have these common things that we see hunched shoulders and poor cervical spine alignment. Um, by addressing all these postural positions gives your body every chance of restoring its stability at all joints not a specific one right? because they're all in related to each other. Um, so there's a good quote from her and you can see the pictures of these um, he, of these ladies here could carrying stuff on their head which would be quite significant weight at times. So correct posture allows people all over the world to carry heavy loads for miles without causing back pain. You can use their know-how to live naturally without pain. Right, and that's quite a, uh, quite a visually um, impacting uh, picture here that, that gives, describes everything that we, we're sort of going to break down. So if we got stretch sitting, then the next one was stretch lying. This first one was stretch lying on your back because there's two stretch lying. There's one on the side and one on the back. And anyone with back pain or any type of pain will often tell you how hard it is to get a good night's sleep. Um, trying to get comfortable can be very difficult because it's hard to get in a position where it's just not compressing things or you know really straining things. So um, the worst part is if you're unable to get rest, it means you're unable to effectively heal yourself because it's when it's done when you're asleep. So the body needs that sleeping time and, and the quality of it to re repair the damaged tissue. So, so the other thing is the poor sleep position that you might get into might be contributing to creating the problem in the first place. So it's important to find a position that enables your body to fully relax. Um, again, this is another example of where she tries to find positions to decompress the discs like we saw with the stretch lying. So um, it basically tries to allow the muscles to lengthen without trying to stretch them. So just using pillows, and you can see here and it's from the book, pillows in specific positions and how to sort of like uh, what to do with your head, your neck, your feet, how to like uh, relieve it. I knew from when I had a lot of problems with my SI joint. Um, you know, in my right hip, I, I found some of these tips really useful. How helping me to just relax even during the day when I just wanted a bit of relief from the pain. It was quite effective, and then it allowed me to work on exercises and way to strengthen myself to to eventually fully get rid of things. But this was really useful for me um, when I was in a lot of trouble. Um, the next one was stack sitting, which is more like. A, like a core version of sitting. So if the first one was decompression, this is like how you almost strengthen the sitting position. So um, it's more as opposed to finding that like the, the like I said here therapeutic ways to relieve it. This trying how to sit upright without any backrest. So you tr now you're going to have to learn how to use your muscles to create the position that you need without creating too much tension, getting fatigue, and maybe straining something. All right, so again she uses clever ways of creating like wedges um, to tip the pelvis forward and you'll see why that's important in this picture here. And this is the uh, cogwheel um, concept that was developed by a Swiss neurologist many years ago and really explains how if one cog tips forward it makes the other one go in the other direction and the other one the other direction so you end up creating a nice tension. Vice versa if, if your pelvis tucks under then, you, then you're getting uh, the, the cog to go in the opposite direction above and same with the, with the neck and the head there above. So you see how one thing can influence many things. That's why you can't just work on a specific area in pain. You have to address them all because they're all influencing each other. So it's a very simple way of explaining how the segments interact with each other. 
Again, the pelvic position is the key here where it must tip forward slightly, which is why you see how she use little wedges all the time to try and assist that person who maybe can't do it because either they don't have the strength or the mobility, so she uses something to assist them in gaining that. All right. Um, with the cogwheel method, there's three primary movers, the anterior pelvis, which is the bottom cog, the elevation of the chest, and the elongation of the neck. All those three concepts need to be put in place when you're doing this stack sitting position here. All right. Um, so very, very, uh, it's really uh, scientific, but at the same time, this is stuff that people in other countries do automatically because if they're trying to rest things on their head, that's the only way they can do it. All right. Now the stack sitting aids, um, so like I said, the little wedge, you can see it clearly here, how she does it and then how she sits down, how she uses her hands to lengthen the back of the neck. Um, and using little positions of the shoulder, you know, to really help improve the position so that you can get into it. I, I myself use something like that because I'm very tight in my hamstring and glutes, and this really, you know, really helps you to achieve this position with less effort. Um, number four would be stretch lying. So we saw it on your back, this time it's on your side. Um, a lot of people have trouble lying on their back either from sleeping, uh, from breathing um, or just the pain. So lying on the sides is actually more comfortable but again this can also cause trouble if there's too much curvatures in creating like a C-shaped hunch position which once again causes all trouble to the discs and the ligaments. Um, so you know the, when the people lie on their side often they'll have that leg come over in front of them which creates like a, a really huge twist in the spine as you can sort of see in this picture here. Um, this a person with an irritated back, this can be a real disaster. Um, at the time they may not find it too painful but it, as when they go to stand and move it definitely becomes a problem. So once again you'll see she'll use specific pillows and positions to help um, aid the person in not getting into that uh, horrible twisted spinal position that causes problems. Uh, the next one which probably comes hand in hand with the stack sitting is bracing the core. Nothing really that I learned differently from this, this is pretty much just reinforced everything I knew but and anyone familiar with strength training and core stability would really be quite um, familiar with this. Um, um, again though it's something that's probably not often taught a lot you know, um, correctly as well so there's a lot of people that have got bad instructions or tips or people that just don't even regard it because they're just looking at the area in pain um, so sometimes people make a real mess of it um, so a good little quote here secret to the abdominal brace is creating total body stiffness by rapid contraction of all the muscles around the torso at exactly the right time so this is a quote from Dr McGill and that's pretty much how I teach it the same way he does um, I won't go into too much detail because this video could go for another 20 minutes if I do. There's videos I've done specifically on this before where I do it in basic fundamental positions on the floor and then how you take that and put it into standing movements where it's integrated joint by joint. So th these are two great videos you'll find on my channel um, that you can check out. That will take you, give you more detailed explanations. But that was one of her lessons that sort of tied all the core st stability strengthening things together which is and the, which is the next one standing which sort of has some part of that requirement because um, just standing on its own you, you've got to resist gravity if you're not doing a good job of doing it you're going to see all these horrible positions again so um, again an another part of this is the foot stability it's where it starts to come up if there's pronation and weakness in the feet that's going to cause trouble up the chain so this is another thing that's often overlooked, um, you know. And and again, like we saw that the the, uh, the the cogwheel concept, you've got to remember how all of those things effectively stack on top of each other, um, you know. And you want to try and like find a way to get in positions where you can make standing. This again, this is, was a problem for me with the SI joint. So people with SI joint problems usually have a lot of compression when they're standing and walking. So finding ways to make this more um, effective and efficient and stronger um, is very very important so the thrusting of the hip forward usually creates a lot of trouble all right so again you don't see that people with carrying stuff on their head do that because they wouldn't be able to carry stuff on their head all right 
So again, she takes you through step by step things. You can see how she she addresses the foot stability first, um, how you create good alignment through the hips and the pelvis, and then how you and then at the end how you create that good position at the neck. All right, so. This is, uh, you know, again, how, like I've said several times, how she's incorporated this from watching people in traditional cultures. It's not a science uh, uh, where it was derived from. It's just from observing people who don't have pain and how they do it, and then we're reverse engineering it, and then maybe getting science to prove why it works. All right, so it's very, very clever sort of... Um, this why it's a very good book to read from cover to cover because it gives you a lot more information what I'm going through here. These are just things that I've sort of found that were very useful that are often overlooked. Right, so the neck and the foot position, how often is that spoken about in standing? If you've got a sore back, you're not usually looking at that, but she's looking very closely at that. All right, so um, the next one, hip hinging, a bit good, like the bracing, is probably two of the things that I've probably spoken about a lot in a lot of exercise things. So everyone would be very familiar with the Romanian deadlift which really is just called bending, so it's not really a gym exercise. It's really just how you're using your hips to um, bend over to pick things up and not bending and not using your spine or your knees or getting in horrible positions that strains it. Um, so in nearly every video about back pain I'm talking about this because it's actually one of the triggers that usually brings on the event itself. So this is usually the pain trigger, especially with bulging discs. So you'll see a lot of this this particular action as the problem. Not necessarily lifting weights, could be just picking a pencil up or tying your shoes. Um, it's just the bending action itself. So learning how to hip hinge, and once again this is observed from watching traditional cultures do it, so they're doing it all day long. So they're saving their back by using their hips all the time, where people who don't uh, in, the, in the West, in the industrialised worlds, tend to use their spine because they don't know how to bend their hips very well. So, so we really need to have a real effort in the, in the early stages of how to save yourself, build the mobility in the hips and also in the strength through the glutes that, that provide the power and the strength to do it. Alright, so at some point, and I've made here, um, we, we must have been doing this and it was passed down from generation to generation, I'm just observing your parents do it and somehow we've lost that as we've just begun to sit more and more and not move as much and not do manual labour as much. So I think part of that, um, you know, I'm sure there's someone that's done studies that's worked out why, but these are some things that are pretty clear to see. Um, last one's walking, and she calls this glide walking. Out of all of them, it's the most complicated and the most difficult to learn. And if you ever were helped, try to help a person with a walking problem, you'll realise how difficult it is. Um, it's, again, this video could go for ages if we wanted to break this down, but I just wanted to bring up the things that were relevant to me. Um, so she refers to this as glide walking because she tries to encourage like a relaxed phase with each stride so to keep the muscles around the hip from tensing up. Um, again, once again a heavy emphasis placed on the uh, maintaining the anterior pelvic tilt and, and also the head and neck position uh, so to avoid thrusting the hips forward. So it's a real common theme with all the standing things um, of how to maintain that good alignment through the spine so it doesn't get strained at any point. A uh, very complicated one to get right, Very, you know, you really need to see the videos of her doing it to get the idea of her, what to do here. It's a bit hard to do it from learning it from the book, you really need to see this in motion. Um, so the interesting tips that I found is to straighten the leg and keep the heel on the ground when the leg is behind you um, to help you feel the glutes engaged. That's why you don't really want to do it too fast and that's why she probably calls it gliding because you, you won't feel it if you do it quickly you have to kind of do it slowly um, the second thing I found really interesting was to try and walk on a line this was quite interesting that and um, she makes a point in the book the oldest known footprints of human were found in Tanzania and they showed two people walking in sand and that they walked on a line their fo footprints were not side by side um, but in just that one straight line. The, the argument is that modern man walks on two lines, but this is a re recent distortion devoid of our natural efficient method of walking. Um, once again, it's something she noted in the traditional cultures where people walk barefoot and do this instinctively. They weren't taught this. This was just something they did. And they all had good foot stability. They all had good hip control. They all moved well. They didn't have back pain. And was, um, 
something quite interesting. I'm sure I'm sure there's something that would go into a lot more detail as to this, but just something that I found very interesting and you know, and you do watch people who have hip a lot of trouble, they do have quite wide gait. Um yeah, it's just something that I found fascinating and I've had I've been looking at it more and more um as you become aware of it. So I don't know, it's something you might gain from this as well. So in summary, um you know, it's a sort of like a video that's more like a book report, um, but I felt it was interesting and it's something that I wanted to share because it's, it's relevant to every one of us, not just people with back pain. The fact that she spent so much time investigating watching people move in traditional cultures, she try and get the wisdom that they had and pass it on to herself and also her patients is incredible. You know what I mean? So, um, well, like, like I said a minute ago, even though like, it seems to refer to back pain people, it really does relate to a lot of things, just improving efficiency of movement and um, best, better posture overall. I don't know who wouldn't want that, you know, so always remember it's easier to prevent problems than to fix them. So many of the learnings she provided um, is with that knowledge is now up to you to decide if you're going to use it or not. So for me, it already sort of changed a lot of the way that I conduct things and I do things, um, maybe I'm not perfect and, and never will be, but if I make some improvements, it does make a big difference. And I did find some of these things have stuck with me from when I was in pain to when I'm not in pain. I still do them as habits now um, and they get easier the more often you practice them. So um, hopefully they get, give something to you, maybe gets you to check it out the book and you might learn something that I didn't learn. All right, and that's, um, that's a good thing. Um, if you had, if you wanted to know more about back pain, there's a program that I do that I had created from a while ago that has a lot of the, the specific exercises, and that would that would need to be done in conjunction with this because it's not it's part of the book where she does talk about you do need to strengthen and do stuff as well. So you can't just rely on those things, but but they're they're, they're not going to be as effective if you don't do these gym, uh, you know, or, or strengthening and core stability specific stretches and so on, they'll work better if you're doing all the other stuff, all right? And the other stuff will work better if you're doing this stuff. So they complement each other, all right? So if you can put these into practice, it might help you to get on top of your problem if you have one. And if you don't have one, hopefully you don't get one by using it, all right? So I hope you've enjoyed that video. It gives you something different to think about. And um, yeah, I'll check you out on our next one.